Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Glad to be home again. There are, there are some places that you go to that you wish you hadn't. And there's some churches I go to, it's like preaching to the living dead. And, and I have to tell you, of all the places, I travel for a living like your bishop does. I travel for a living. And, and, and I got a lot of miles on my carcass. And most of the places I go to, I'm supposed to go there to resurrect the dead. But this is the, one of the few churches I go to that you resurrect me. You, you encourage me. You, you help me. Amen. Just a pleasure, pleasure to be with you. And thank you, Brother Wood, for being so kind to invite me again. And, uh, and Brother Lehman, just, you know, they're just a class act, you know. They're, they're not the team of co erupt They're a class act. I, I leaned over to Brother Lehman a minute ago and I said, do you think you guys could use an old youth leader with some puppets and use magic tricks? <laughs> I work cheap. I work cheap. <laughs> Amen. Glad to be with you. Thank you for letting me come. I've prayed and prayed that somehow this weekend would be monumental, that something would, would start in here that I would not finish. And, uh, and I told you last time, and you may not remember, but you have to be able to go to heaven from your last church service. That's why your service has to be monumental. It has to be your very best, okay? I, I'm going I'm to read a portion of scripture and I'm, I'm going to go all over the place, I'm sure. And, uh, and, and again, thank you, anybody that prayed for me. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. First Samuel, I want to read two, two portions of Scripture. First Samuel chapter 27. And then uh, First Samuel chapter 30. Man. I'm going to preach like a house of fire. <laughs> you better get out. You better get the fire extinguishers out. I'm going to burn the barn down, buddy. I've had so many situations and strokes and seizures and hospital deals. I ain't got time to just, oh, yes. I ain't going to do, that ain't going to happen with me, man. I'm going to, if I go dying, I'm going flying, man. I'm, well, we used to sing that song, we Americanos did. You don't know like I know what he's done for me. I act kind of crazy because he picked me up. I act kind of exuberant because I was on my way out and he just snatched me back and pulled me back and just wouldn't let death have me. And so I'm just living on, I guess, borrowed time or something. So I'm excited. I'm, I know I look 42, but I'm 72. And, 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 and you've got to understand something. I have never got over this. I, I, I pastor people that got over it. I've never got over this. I've never been over being astonished at the grace and the mercy of God. I, I've never got over the fact that he's forgiven me over and over and over and over and over. In fact, excuse me for making you stand so long, but, but, but I read a statement the other day. Man, I wish I'd have thought of that. It was in a little book, and it said, you know, people that come to church and never get carried away, they ought to. <laughs> then I read another statement I thought was so cool. It said a Jewish rabbi talked to his congregation on Saturday and said to them, would you like to make God laugh? The congregation thought for a minute and said, yes. He said, tell them your plans. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's go and read. 1 Samuel 27, verse 1. And David said in his heart, I will now perish one day by the hand of Saul, and there is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel so I shall escape out of his hand. 
And David and Rose and his men, the 600 men, and they went unto Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. That's all I want. Okay, that's all I want. Then I'm going over to 1 Samuel chapter 30. You like to turn there? As the old saying is, you need to go right or you're going to be left. Okay? And I'm reading chapter 30, verse 1. It came to pass that when David had come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire, had taken the women captives and that were therein, slew not any, neither great nor small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal. I always thought that was so, so neat. I know the Bible had big thing about names. We don't make a big thing. But, but Abigail and Ahinam are two names. One means joy and the other means grace. Let me, let me try it. I'll help you with it. Hell's after your joy. And hell, and hell wants to frustrate the grace. And, and if he can, he'll take it away. I'm, all, I'm almost there. Man, I feel so good being alive. I just feel so good. I'm telling you what, I just, okay, anyway, so he had no more power to weep, and David lost his two wives. Blah, blah, blah. David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. You know, things haven't changed in thousands of years. Anytime hell breaks loose, kill the preacher. <laughs> Anytime problems show up, kill the leader. They did the same thing with Moses. Moses puts on the biggest jailbreak recorded in human history. Two and a half to three million people, he gets out of jail in one night, and when they have a little trouble eating and drinking, let's kill him. As long as they're eating and drinking, they got man and they got water out of a rock. The man's cool, man. He's great. He's the man. The minute they have a little bit of problem, let's kill that sucker. That is so crazy. And so this is what they're doing. Now, you got to understand something. When you decide to attack your leadership, you must also understand that your leadership is hurting as much as you are. Because David lost his stuff too and lost his, lost his wives and lost everything and yet they got mad and said, well, let's stone him. Okay, because their soul of the people was greed, every man his son and daughters. And David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Abimelech's son, I pray thee bring hither the ephod. And Abathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, and thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Lord, bless the preaching. Help me to be a blessing to these people in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're so nice. Okay. Am I going to be here long? As long as you want, brother. Amen. I feel, like the Lord, I feel like the Lord's given me a theme for these three services, and one's going to tie into the next one. But, but you've got to hear what I'm fixing to tell you. I want to talk to you tonight on the subject, the power and the peril of perception. The, thank you for the amens. Thank you. The power and the peril of perception. Perception has got long interpretation to it in the dictionary, but it literally means to be able to grasp, to comprehend, to perceive, to see, to have an inner persuasion in one's mind, how you perceive something. If you don't remember anything else, remember this statement. Perception is always greater than reality. It always greater than reality. Let me try another one. This is a great sermon. I preached this. I was famous when I preached this one. You got to hear this. David said in his heart, I will now one day perish at the hand of Saul. Let me help you with it, baby. Saul couldn't kill David with a bazooka. No, you're laughing because it sounds funny. That lying devil trying to sell you, he can take you out. He couldn't take you out. He couldn't take you out if he wanted to take you out. Greater is he that is in you 
than he that is in the world. And if God be for you, it does not matter who or what is against you. Hello. Now, you, you be seated. I, I, I've, been, I've been preparing, uh, Reverend, Reverend and Reverend. I've been preparing for the, for the uh, conduct and the, and the attitude of Canada. And I remember the last time when I preached at that library. And, and I'm trying not to be frustrated. And yet I told people all over UPC, it blew my mind that when I finished, you were sitting there silent looking at me. But when we had the altar call, it was like a stampede of wild buffalo, man. You just, I wish to God our church would do that. Usually our church, they're jumping and carrying on. When I finish preaching, they go home. So, you know, you don't have to do it, but once in a while it just helps me a little bit. See, I know I look like a college professor, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah, see, when I went to college, I really did go to college. I can spell and add and everything. And when I went to college, the college professor, he would just lecture to you. And he didn't give a flip whether you passed or not. He got paid anyway. Your passing grade had nothing to do with his finance. Well, if you're not careful, you'll develop that kind of attitude when you come to church. I'm the professor, you're the class. And I just lecture. I'm going to let that settle for a second. Now, here's what you got to understand. When David said in his heart, I will one day perish at the hand of Saul. Please hear me. I may never pass this wonderful way again. Hear me. Be careful how you talk to yourself. Yes, sir. Right. 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 Woo! Yes, sir. There's a lot of voices in this world, the TV, the radio, the internet, the in-laws, the outlaws, the politicians, the crooks, all kinds of people. All day long you're being bombarded with voices, with voices. But none of them have the power that your voice has. They can try to persuade you. They can try to inspire you. They can try to deflate you. But you cast the final ballot. You either say yes or you say no. You either talk your way into something or you talk your way out of something. That's why David went on record and said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his course with praise. And I will be thankful and I'll make a joyful noise. No hell ain't gonna stop me. Satan ain't gonna shut me down. People sitting alongside me know he's been too good to me. He's been too kind to me. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and woo, all that he's done for me, I got to say thank you. I got to praise him. I got to get excited. You don't know like I know. Woo, woo, woo. Wait a minute. I know you, I know you, don't sit down. I'm, don't sit down. I know you're simmering down, but I'm going to challenge you right now. I can't have see you, so I don't know whether you like me or not. Has he been good to you? Yeah. Has he ever forgiven you? Yeah. Has he ever touched your body? Yeah. Has he ever calmed your nerves? Has he ever made a way where there was not a way? Yeah. Has he ever picked you up and told you to run on, baby? Has he ever forgiven you for something that you made a mistake over and over and over and over again? Has he ever picked you up and not brought up your past? Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. When that blood gets over you, you ain't got no yesterday. You ain't got no past. All you got is a future. Excuse me, I, I didn't mean to wake everybody up at one time. You you be seated. I, I'm just a professor lecturing. I'm just lecturing. I'm just talking. You, you, you think I'm kidding you. God is watching this service, and he's got his little measurement thermometer out to just see what level your praise goes to. 
We got these wussified Pentecostals. I'll oh, praise the Lord. We got the other Pentecostals got their mind on leaving, just going, glory. But there's a few people in here like this that said, man, if he hadn't stepped into my mess, if he hadn't spoken peace to my mind, I would have, I would have lost my mind. When hell said he wanted me, heaven said, you can't have her. You can't have him. They got a destiny. Woo. You, 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 you be seated. I, I just, excuse me, Reverend. I'm just excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with this stuff about perception. But you got to be careful how you talk to yourself. Because you can talk yourself into stuff and talk yourself out of stuff. But you can talk yourself into hell and you will never talk your way out of it. Listen to me. We love to preach the story of the prodigal son. Do you understand what the whole issue of the prodigal son is? He talked himself out of the pig pen. The choir didn't bring him out. Jeff Arnold's tape ministry didn't bring him out. All the preachers in Pentecost didn't bring him out. He's sitting with the oink oinks and the stinky mud and the stinky pigs and turns around and says, I'm better than this. What in the world am I doing in here? The servants in my house are doing better. I'm out of here. I'm going back home. I got news for you. If you tell yourself to head towards God, God will never turn a deaf ear to you. God will never turn away from you. God will never reject you because the father saw him coming a long way off yeah. before you see that you few people that are standing that I can see will you turn and look at someone and say I'm coming out of this say no no I'm coming out of this no don't do that wussy fight I'm coming out of this no no I'm coming out of this if you yell at the ball game, you yell over catching a fish, and you get excited about buying a pickup truck, you're, I'm coming out of this. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know what it's going to take, I don't know how long it's going to take, but God is going to help me get out of this. And when I get out of this, I'm going to have a testimony. You, you'd be seated. I'm just, I'm just going a little crazy here. I'm sorry. To, I don't mean to offend nobody. But I'm talking about the power and the peril of perception. Because how you see things determines how you react to things. It's the old saying, outlook determines outcome. And attitude determines altitude. And, and the biggest, I don't want to hurt, you're, you're, you're the Bible scholar, so you can correct this later after I leave, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm the part of the UPC, okay? I, you punch him, Charlie. I'm part of one of the boys. Are you ready? But I'm going to tell you, right. I'm on the internet. I'm all over the world. Well, listen to me, all you holy rollers. The main issue is not truth. We Pentecostals have gone to seed on that. We know the truth. We got the truth. We obeyed the truth. We believe the truth. That's right. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. True. I understand that. But the issue is not truth because truth is truth whether you believe it or not. Right. Truth is truth whether we obey it or not. The issue, Reverend, is perception. How we perceive the truth. If we perceive the truth correctly, it liberates us. If we perceive the truth incorrectly, it defeats us. I've heard so many holy roller folks quote that 831, 32. Said, then Jesus said to those disciples which believed on him. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You ready, Canada? Jesus just said it's possible to be a believer and still be bound. Then said, then said Jesus to those disciples that believed on him, I'm a believer. And he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. So you can be a believer and not be a disciple. Because you see, you have a believer, you just believe information. When you're a disciple, you've applied the information. 
I, I'm going to wait. And the book said, he said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm going to know I'm on worldwide TV. Listen to me. Are you ready? The truth is not just a principle or a precept or a doctrine. That's what we've made it. You shall know the truth. Acts 2.38, John 3.16, John 5, 8 through 10. No, 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 no. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. Watch what he does. You shall know the truth. See, it's possible to believe the written word and not know the living word. That's why we have thousands of denominations who point to what they believe from the written word, but they don't have a real experience with the living word. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? If I'm the Lord, how come you don't obey? How come you don't submit? How come you don't surrender? How come you don't give me your best? If you call me Lord, why don't you do what I tell you? Oh, because I'm a believer. You see, when you're a believer, it don't cost you much. I believe in Jesus. I, I believe in, in heaven. I believe in God. I believe in the Ten Commandments. I, believe, I met this moron the other day in the mall, and I was walking around, and I was talking to him, and got to talk to him about God, and he turns around and he goes, well, you know, I, I just live by the Ten Commandments. I said, you know, I don't know you, but you're like one of them balloons. The only thing that keeps them balloons up is hot air. What's keeping you down? <laughs> so I looked at him, and I said, you live by the Ten Commandments? Yes, I do. I said, I got a pocket full of money. Name them. You can't believe it. Go ahead. You live by the Ten Commandments. Name them. I got time. Name them. He got to about four of them. I said, what do you do with the other six? You know why? Because when you are a believer, it doesn't cost you much. When you are a disciple, it'll cost you everything. Yes, sir. Now you understand it's progressive. He said to those that believe, you're on your way to being disciple. That's what you're supposed to do. Now watch. Here's what determines believers and disciples. Perception. You cannot receive until you perceive you got to see before you experience. The only reason you got the baptism of the Holy Ghost talking in tongues is because somehow, someway, God helped you perceive that God wanted you to have it. That's why you got water baptized in Jesus' name. I wish I had a witness in the house. I, I know I'm in Canada in a cemetery plot. I wish some... I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, okay? I, I, I'm not passing. Listen, you folks, will you stop imitating tombstones and become lively stones? Yeah. Perception. Perception can defeat you or can deliver you. How you perceive it. When I read the scriptures studying today for this message over in Numbers 14, we know the story. The 10 spies went to get into the promised land. Now watch, I'm going to make a few statements going to fry your brain a little bit, but it'll be okay. We'll, we'll put the fire out in a minute. You ready? They were given the promised land by divine guarantee. If you don't remember nothing, remember this. The promises of God are not self-fulfilling. Let me tell you what, they don't, I don't teach in Bible school. They need me. I, they really need me. They don't ask me, but they need me. See, the promises of God are simply revelations of divine intention. Yes, sir. When God gives you a promise, he literally goes on record and said, this is what I plan to do. Yes, sir. And then he steps back and says, now what are you going to do to help it happen? Ask and you shall find. Knock, it shall be open. 
You got to do something. You got to respond to it. God leaves you an open door, but if you don't go through the door, the door, whether it's open or closed, didn't help nobody. You got to go through it. You got to act on it. So when God gave Israel these promises, do you realize that they spent 38 to 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and when they fell over, they were holding promises in their hand? Like a bunch of stupid people that say they believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. That's so nice. And they said, look, we're pregnant with promises. We've got promises. Yeah, but you're not in the promised land. Oh, I know, but I, I, I have a promise. I mean, you're talking about millions of people that died in the wilderness. You know why they died? That will blow your mind. Well, not your mind. Your mind's baptized, but close. You ready? Ten people sentenced an entire nation over bad perception. Yes, sir. That's right. Yes. Well, I'm coming down here in the cheap seats right now. You need to look around you right now. If you're sitting next to somebody who don't worship, move. If you're sitting next to somebody who never says amen, get away from them. Because the potentate is on the prowl. And the king is looking to bless. And the king is looking, woo! And the king is looking to heal. And the king is looking to encourage. And you don't need to be defeated by somebody's bad perception. You, you, you can sit down. Good boy, good boy, good boy. Sit down here. You stay with me now. Don't worry about the living dead. You stay with me. You got me? Watch. Ten guys came back. Numbers 14. He, they sent him out to spy the land, correct? Now, this has always been odd to me. Now, you can explain this to me later, okay, because you've got a baptized brain. The Bible says they came back from the promised land, watch, with the fruit of the land. Behold, I give you a land flowing with milk and honey. And they get a hold of these grapes the size of bowling balls. And they call it, they carry them in between two guys' shoulders. Now watch. They, that's the promised land. It's theirs as a gift. It's been promised to them. And God can't lie. But they won't act on the promise. They just believe. I believe. And when they come back, they come back with these grapes like bowling balls. Took Two guys to carry one cluster. And they said, we brought back the fruit of the land. Now, to me, everybody would have went, woo, God. It's just like God said it was. Let's go. And then they come back with a story and no proof. We saw giants. We saw the sons of Anak. We saw walled cities. We saw problems ahead. And because of our perception... We focused on the problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Right. And I'm sitting there, I'm saying in my mind, are you stupid or do you just look stupid? You just spent 400 years in Egypt's bondage. Look at that problem. And God sent a man who stuttered with a magic stick. And in a matter of a few moments, he wiped the whole kingdom out and you walked out free. You think, woo, you think God can't handle your new problem? You think God's not greater than the thing that, the devil is a liar. If God said it, it's going to happen. But I have to act on it. I have to respond to it. My perception has to become a catalyst that lets God work. Yeah. My God, I'm talking good. I'm talking good. You didn't sit down. Now watch. If I'd have been one of those Jews, I thank God I wasn't, but if I was one of those Jews, and, and, and when they brought back the bowling ball grapes, I said, "Woo, man, there's proof that God ain't lying. All right. Then they brought back this crazy story. Giants that are so big, we're grasshoppers in our own sight. I had a guy in our church does that little antichrist computer stuff, and, and he did that thing on a computer. He said, in order for a six-foot man to be considered a grasshopper in the sight of somebody else, the other person had to be 50 foot tall. That's what happens when your perception gets perverted. That's what happens when your focus gets foggy. 
Now, you might as well be honest with me, you Canadians. You might as well be honest with me now. Every one of us at times have come up and faced something that almost bowled us over, almost stole our faith, almost threw rain on our parade. Amen? And, and we said in our own hearts, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get through this? How's this going to turn around? What's going to happen? There's nothing wrong with talking to yourself as long as you end up talking to God after you talk to yourself. When you turn around and tell yourself, I can't make it. That's right. You can't make it. But if you turn around and tell yourself, yeah, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can make it. And if God be for me, and no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and I am not an experiment, I am a redeemed child of God. That's why the writer in Psalm said, let the, I'm sorry, I don't mean to hurt your feeling, Canada. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're not redeemed, keep your mouth shut. If you are redeemed, and the God that brought you out is going to bring you through, and the God that's bringing you through is going to bring you to. Because perception is always greater than reality. Just stay with me. Stay with me just a few minutes. I haven't preached too long, have I? No? Okay. I just, I just got to get to some of this. I just, to me, you know, because I'm an ex-New Yorker, okay? And New York is a bunch of crooks and criminals and creeps and street people. We're just street people. That's what we are. And, and if, if my inheritance was in the balance over your report, before I give away my inheritance... I would make you produce a giant. I've already got the prize, big grapes. Okay, now show me a problem. That's why I don't like sitting next to nincompoops. I don't like sitting next to jerks. I don't like sitting next to negative people. I don't do it. I just don't do it. Uh, you know, I, I preach a lot of black churches all over America, PAW church. I love preaching for black people. I just love them. They'll preach your socks off you. You can just say this to a black church. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the choir. You just start saying, well, you don't know. Uh-huh. They, I like black churches because you know why? Black churches, they talk back to you. White churches, they let you kill yourself. That's the truth. That's the truth. You just preach to those sweet black people and they'll go, uh-huh, bring it on now, preacher. Come on, make it play right on now. Mm-hmm, go ahead. Come on now. Put your watch away. Don't worry about time. Come on. And, and the white people are going, I got to get to the pizza place. I, No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so rude, but, you know, the, 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 uh, this ain't a lecture. See, you are the children of a speaking God. Now, I don't mean to be offensive, Rev and Rev, but I do not know what almighty means. Now, you probably do because you've got a baptized brain, but I don't know what almighty means. I don't know what it means when it says God's got all power. Because there ain't nothing in this world that even comes close to that. So you usually go from the known to the unknown when you learn something. And when the scripture says, I'm almighty God, what in the world does that mean? To what dimension does that go? He's almighty God. You ready for this? And he never made anything with his mouth shut. for his people. 
I'm, I'm just not emotional. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> You're not emotional. No, sure. Everybody's emotional. You're just selective with your emotion. Now that blows. I'm sorry if I'm boring you, but this has got a hold of me so bad. He's got all power, yet he never made anything with his mouth shut. Ten times. No, there's three. I know you're the baptized brain, but there's three sets of Ten Commandments. We only teach two. Moses got two sets of Ten Commandments, okay? We know he got them at Mount Sinai. He broke the one set, went and got another, put it in the mercy seat. But there was a set of Ten Commandments before that that I ain't never heard nobody in Pentecost preach. He gave the first set of Ten Commandments in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, the scripture says ten times, and God said, and God said, let there be light. Let there be a firmament in the midst. Let the seas bring forth. Let the fowls of the air go in the heavens. Let the earth bring forth. Let there be a... Ten times he said, let there be. That was the Ten Commandments. And, and they have never been broken. And when he gave the second and third set of Ten Commandments... <coughs> Nobody ever kept them until he showed up in the body of Jesus and he kept them. Because he said, I am Alpha and I am Omega and I am the beginning and I am the ending and I am the first and I am the last and I am the Rose of Sharon and I am the Lily of the Valley and I'm the bright and the morning star and I'm the root and the offspring of David. You ready for this? And I'm on your side. I said, I'm on your side. Can nothing take you out of my hand? Can nothing take you away from me? You've got a destiny. Woo. You be seated. Just hold on a second. I got to get a drink. They think this is water. <laughs> Oh, God, I love this. I just love this. <laughs> you, got, you got to hear me. You see, children, let me talk to you, children. Look, your adversary wants your problem to become your prison house. So he can allow your problem through your wrong focus to hold you hostage. I wish I had a witness. I got a few sweet black people over here. They already talked to me. Fine. I need some of you whiteies to answer up here. Okay, the words amen. amen. Remember, I told you this. You need to hear it again. God made nothing with his mouth shut. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Sometimes when you don't know what to do and you don't know how to come out of it, you need to just lift your voice saying, Jesus, I love you and I praise you and I believe you and I know you're going to help me and you're not going to forsake me and you're going to bring me out. Sometimes all you got is your perception, but your perception is enough. Stay, stay with me. I'm, I'm trying to go as fast as I can. You got to hear me. This, this perception thing. I hope I'm not boring you with all this. This is, you, you, you got to understand. You see, your adversary wants your problem become your prison house. Your ally wants your problem to become a pathway. One wants to stop you. One wants to take you. You go preach this wherever you preach, okay? This is powerful. David says three times in that 27 chapter, he said, I got to escape. That is the damnable curse of the Pentecostal movement. We have raised a generation that they always want to escape trouble. I want to escape. I want to get away from it. Do you ever think that sometimes God allows trouble so you could endure it?
David said, I got to escape. Read it in Psalms. I wish I had the wings of a dove. Then would I escape and fly away. Jeremiah, I wish I had a place in the wilderness so I could just escape. That's our mentality. We always want to escape when hell comes and trouble comes and problem comes. But God's turned around and said, why do you keep trying to escape? I put you there. So as you endure this, you will grow. You will mature. You will learn more about me. Let me ask you a question. I've had two of these stupid strokes and a couple of dumb things that's happened to me. Fine. Can God trust you with trouble or are you just a wussy? The wind always has to blow at the back of my neck. I never want the wind blowing in my face. So all the mountains that you climb are always downhill? You know, you know what you sweet people need up here in this wonderful church? Some fresh trouble. I'm going to see if I can just pray and God couldn't just give you a truckload. Why? Because they overcame him according to Revelation 12 by the word of their testimony. But you can't have a word of testimony until you have a test. Come on, you, if you're going to go in the city where the lamb is the light, you're going to have scars, you're going to have messes, you have come through, I come through this and I come through that and I've been through this and I've been through that, but he brought me out. And the God that brought us out of sin will bring us out of our trouble. I don't know how long he's going to make us stay in our trouble, but he will not forsake us and he will not turn his back on us. He's going to help us. Can I talk a few minutes here? Please be, please be seated. I, I, I'm not trying to mess with you. Yeah, excuse me, I'm lying. I am trying to mess with you. There's 42 chapters in the book of Job. 42. Do you realize that we wouldn't have the blessing of Job 40, 41, and 42 if Job had done the Pentecostal thing and bailed out? Do you realize what the blessing of all, and I lost, he lost 10 kids. That's just horrible. I don't know how he could even put up with that. He had his wife that didn't understand things. He had those three idiot friends. I hope I never meet them dirtbags anywhere. <laughs> friends like that, you might as well go get married to Adolf Hitler, man. Them, 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 guys, them guys are jerks, man. Them guys are crazy. Now watch. When he turned around, guess what? Guess what his trouble did for him? Though he was sobbing, that he was cursing the day that he was ever born, wish to God he'd never been born, can't understand why God has put himself against me. He endured all that junk, watch, for the prize. What was the prize? For the first time in his life, he talked to God face to face. Bible said the Lord answered him out of the whirlwind. You know what the whirlwind is? A storm. There's no evidence that he ever heard God's voice before. There's no, you're not getting it. If you will endure instead of trying to escape, there's going to be a reward and experience at the end of your enduring that's going to blow your socks off. You don't think it's possible, but it is possible. Because he declares the end from the beginning and the things that are not as though they were. He knows what he's got in mind for you and I when he allows that junk to happen. And God is using us, if you can bear with me just a minute, to shut hell's, sit down, to shut hell's mouth. You ever thought of that? Your trouble, your sorrow, your pain, your fears, your anxieties, your worries are all tools that God has put into your life. Said, okay, now act the right way and shut hell's mouth. Because after chapter three, if I am correct, reverend, theologian, scholar man, after chapter three, you don't find Satan anywhere on that farm. He don't, he, don't, he don't want to do it with somebody who stays thankful when, yes, they're, when they're crying. He doesn't want to do it with somebody who's buried some of their children with a very stupid thing and can't understand why and God stays silent. Yes, 
See, when we pack in hostels, we're so emotionally involved that sometimes we have a hard time fellowshipping the silence of heaven. What do you do when God's not talking? Oh, I can tell you what I do. I keep walking. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because he don't ever change. He's immutable. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. You can count on me. When the going gets tough, I'm going to come. I'm going to. But you want me to bail you out, and I want to have you endure. Now, I'm, 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 I'm not a liar. I'm not a hypocrite, but I, I'm trying to be honest. I don't know whether I made it with the three Hebrew guys. Because if I was one of those three Hebrew guys, I'd say, okay, Jehovah, any minute, just blow the fire out. And I believe you. Just go, just blow it out. And God turns around and says, nah, just endure it. You didn't get it. Let me try it again. You're hearing aid on. You ready? You listen? Watch. He said, endure it. If you will endure it, I'll show up in the furnace. Yes, sir. I'll give you an experience in your trouble that you never thought was possible. I don't know about you, but I like for God to show up every once in a while, make my hair stand up and give me a little goosebumps and turn around and say, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you and I'll never put on you more than you can bear. And with every test and every trial, I'll make a way of escape. Turn and look at someone, shout at them, said, I'm coming out of this. I don't know when, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I am going to endure and I'm not going to insult God's wisdom that keep crying in my root beer and sucking my thumb wanting to escape. We got too many escape artists in UPC. We need enduring artists. We need people to go through the fire and go through the water and go through the sorrow and go through the problems. I didn't say it was fun. I just said it was the will of God. Can I preach a little longer? I want to preach a little longer. I haven't got to my sermon yet. I'm sorry. I'm talking about perception. I'm talking about how powerful perception is. Perception is so powerful. Now, wait a minute. Don't get you on TV land. Don't, don't twist what I said. I didn't say the truth wasn't important. I said the truth's not the issue. The perception of the truth is the issue because the perception is what gives birth to the practice. And if your perception of the truth is incorrect, your practice becomes perverted. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I will, I will one day now die by the hand of Saul. You, you got to be kidding, David. You're the only giant killer in the whole land. You think this schmo could kill you? Did that old man Samuel with the shaking hand and the white beard and that bottle of oil, did he come up and put that, that vial of oil on your head? Did the spirit of the Lord come upon you, 1 Samuel 17, from that day forward? And he said, don't worry about nothing, baby cakes. He didn't say baby cakes. I said baby cakes. Don't worry about baby cakes. He said, you'll be the next king. Now, if God has designed for him to be the next king, who can take him out? If God has designed for you to be more than a conqueror, who can take you out? If God has designed for you to be a trophy of grace, who can take you out? The problem is not the problem. The problem is our perception of the problem. Woo! Bear bear with me just a few minutes, Reverend, okay? Just bear with me. Now watch. So what does he do? He runs away. You can sit down. He runs away. He's in the land of the Philistines with Achish the king. He's acting the hypocrite. If you read 1 Samuel 27, 28, 29, he's become a liar. He's become a deceiver. Achish says, oh, I've treated him. He's like, you read it. It says, he's like an angel of God to me. I have it written in my Bible. Right, a deceiving angel. 
a lying angel. Because he'd ask him, he said, where'd you go today? I said, oh, I made a track towards the south here. No, he went north and killed everybody. Killed the women, killed the children, so there was no witnesses. You can have no idea if your perception gets fouled up, you have no idea what you're capable of doing. Stuff that you never would have thought that you would ever start doing again when your perception gets wrong. That's why I pastor people. I don't pastor, well, I'm unemployed. I don't pastor, but I pastor for 36 years. And I pastor people, always had a problem with dress codes, always had a problem with worship, always had a problem with tithing, always had a problem with being faithful. You know what the issue was? Not the truth, their perception. Well, I don't see that this is any reason to do that. I just don't see it that way. And you got to hear me, please. I'm not trying to be offensive. Your opinion don't count. My opinion doesn't count either. If, if, you know, they used to sing that little song in Sunday school years ago. Jesus said, I believe it and it's so. I'm going to help you with it. Whether you believe it or not, it is so. And whether we behave or not, it still is so. And we were living in a generation that believes Moses came down from the mountain with the 10 suggestions. And now we're living in a generation that is trying to ab abort and pervert and disgrace the gospel. Please hear me. Don't let anybody tell you there's any other gospel than one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Don't let anybody ever tell you that Acts 2.38 is not the New Testament new birth into the kingdom. The devil is a liar. There's, there's only one Lord and only one faith and only one baptism and one God above all, above all, and in you all. And he's the father of all. You got to hold on to that tenaciously because there's winds blowing every which way and Pentecostal people are starting to act crazy. You better stay married to the things that are right because we're closer to the coming of the Lord than where any generation has ever been. You, you, you didn't sit down. You didn't sit down. I'm, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can. I'm sorry I've got so much I need to say, but it's just, it, it just got me. You got you to gotta get me. Perception becomes the catalyst that releases God to work. Now, now, I introduced my sermon with a title, and you probably wonder, he ain't touched the title yet. I'm going to touch it right now. The power and the peril of a perception. According to Mark 6, Jesus went to Nazareth where he was raised and could do no mighty works there, not because he didn't have the power and not because he didn't want to and not because it wasn't part of his ministry, but their perception turned it into a prison house. He said, oh, that's that carpenter's kid that lived down the street. He's trying to be some kind of big deal. And he marveled at their unbelief. Now watch, read it. You go over, it's, 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 it's recorded in Luke 5 and 6. He left Nazareth and went to Capernaum. And the Bible said, first he healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law with the fever. I've often wondered that scripture. You can help me with that scripture. It says she was taken with a mighty fever. And Jesus stood over her. And rebuked it. In other words, he talked to the fever. See, you gotta, we, we got to stop talking to people. That spirits that's causing a lot of this stuff. And that doesn't mean you're demon possessed. It just means there are spirits of infirmity. There are spirits that mess with the human mind. you got to be able to talk to that thing. I lost you just now. <laughs> I just lost you. He said, he rebuked the spirit. He spoke to fever. Stop it. Get out. And she got up and served the people. See, that's what happens at Pentecost. We get healed, but we don't go serve. She said, you just done something good for me. I'm going to do something good for you. You're not getting it yet. He goes to Capernaum. Read it. Chapter 5, chapter 6 of Luke. He says, and they came to him at sunset. And they brought to him many sick and diverse diseases and, and filled with divers diseases and demons. Watch this. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them all. Wait a minute. Same Jesus, same power, same desire, same love, same mercy, different congregation. Right, right, right. You know what the problem was, Rev? Their perception put him in prison. I want God to come in here in just a few minutes in a strong way and allow your perception 
to let him go free. Yes, yes. And let him throw his weight around. And let him heal who he wants to. And let him fill with the Holy Ghost. Ah. Yeah. And let him encourage somebody that's discouraged. Let him give some visions and dreams to people. Let some people get some encouragement. Let God throw his weight around in this house. Knock over a few tables. Crack the window open. Knock over the lamp. Let him bust a move in this place. I, I, I need five minutes. I need five minutes. I, I've got two hours, but I need five minutes. You, 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 you got to hear me. If your perception becomes wrong or your focus is foggy, your faith will be damaged and you will study the problem and not the answer. We all talk about Peter walking on the water. He did real good till he studied the storm. Hey, by the way, could I ask some of you wonderful theologians in the promised land of Canada? <laughs> could you just tell me after the service, don't go to the preacher, me. How far did he walk? I'll wait. <laughs> now, he couldn't see him. He looked like he was a ghost. He was a phantom. So it wasn't lit up like the Super Bowl or the Astrodome. It was dark out there. It was raining, cats and dogs. It was crazy. And, and, and he said, if it be you, bid me come. Oh, let me ask you a question while I'm here for one more time. How long has it been since you asked God, let me do something I ain't never done? I'm crazy. I know I'm crazy. I need theory, theology, uh, therapy. I know I need it. It's okay. I don't need it from you. I just need it. But I'm crazy. I, I'm so agitated about when are we going to start doing what the Book of Acts Church did? The answer is real easy. Soon as our perception changes. Soon as we realize that God wants to do for us what he did for them. But we've got to see him more than we're seeing him like. See, our perception of Jesus is not quite right. They saw him as the killer and the, the, the defeater of death itself. We only see him as an answer once in a while. You've got to understand that he's high and lifted up and his, his train fills the temple. You've got to understand that he's king of kings and he's lord of lords and, and his name is above every other name and his glory is above every other glory and everything is underneath his feet and he's calling to us. He said, ask what you will. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. He that comes to me must believe that I am and that I am a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That is not about the truth. That is about perception of the truth. Could I ask you a question? I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I feel like I'm offending you. I don't mean to offend you. Uh, well, let me ask you a question. How would you act? What would you try? What would you attempt Right now, if you were persuaded, convinced, sure, God would back you up. Who would you pray for? Who would you witness to? Who would you ask to come to church if you were sure God wouldn't leave you hanging? See, it's our perception that becomes our prison house. It's our perception that holds us hostage. See, some of you sweet people right now, here's what you're saying. You're looking at me, you're saying, who, me? Let me help you with a spiritual, yes, you. You're not getting it yet. I gotta, I gotta go over to the theology department. Hold on. <laughs> over here, oh, great scholars and theologians. The angel is talking to Gideon. And he says, oh, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon does what the Pentecostals do. Hey, me? 
And the angel says, yeah, you. <laughs> you know what the problem is? His perception has made him see he's not able to do anything. I'm the least in my family. We're the smallest tribe. See, perception will stop truth. Perception will hang it and choke it by the neck. And God's got to have this ongoing debate with this schmo to finally get him to believe. And if you read your Bible, you do read the Bible. If you, if you read the Bible, he, God could not convince him. You know what God did? I know how I can help this schmo. He'll believe a sinner before he believes me. And he sends him into the camp with his servant Pura. And he says, go down and hear what they say. This has always been so mind-boggling to me. And he sneaks in. Now here's this man who's been given a promise by God. And God's going to stand with him. And he's going to whip the Midianites. And he's going to defeat him like one man. And I'm with you. Everything's fine. Watch what he, read it. Read it. Judges 6, 7. Read it. He turns around and says, but if you don't believe me. Let, me, let me paraphrase that. But if you think I'm a liar. If, if I'm such a schmo, you can't trust me. If I vacillate and flip-flop so all the time you have no confidence in me, take your servant and go down and hear what they say. And, and watch this bold man with an angelic visit and a voice from God. He, he climbs in the bushes. I'm a man of faith. I always think it's, I think God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> because, see, what he did is he thumped that one Midian in the head, bonk, and gave him a dream. And he slapped the other one upside his head. <laughs> Said, give him the interpretation. You ain't the only people that God gives dreams to. And they change in guards and Gideon's in the bushes. Mighty man of faith. Mighty man of valor. Who, me? And, and the guard turns around and he says, Umgawa. Said, I had a dream last night. Really? Said, what was the dream? He said, I saw this cupcake. <laughs> he called it a barley loaf, but a barley loaf is just a cupcake. And he turned around and he said, and I saw this cupcake come rolling down the hill. And it hit the tent stake. And it knocked the tents over and knocked the whole camp apart. And the other guy jumps up. hey Umgawa. <laughs> and says, I've got the interpretation. He says, what's the interpretation? He said, the cupcake is Gideon. And I see the angel saying, I told you, I told you, I told you, get rid of your stupid perception. Change your perception. Woo! Some of you right now, you need to let those promises of God come alive in your life. No matter how impossible or how improbable they may look and believe. Who, me? Yeah, you. God wants to bless you. God wants to anoint you. God wants to make you more than you are. You don't need to sit. You can stand with me. I'm finishing right now. You need to come and pray and ask God to alter your perception if your perception has got a lot of doubt in it. If your perception has got too many questions in it. you got to turn around and say, if God called me and God anointed me, then God's going to use me. It has nothing to do about me being worthy. It has nothing to do about me being a great man or a great lady. No, it has to do about divine choice. If you read the rest of that scripture, the Bible said, first time, Gideon broke out worshiping. Huh. Yes. Isn't it funny? He didn't worship when God gave him the promise. He worshiped when the pagan gave him the answer. Wow. He goes just, umgawa. He said, come on, boys. The Lord has delivered the host of the Midians into our hands. See, sometimes you got to say it before it happens. Sometimes you got to act by faith and not by feeling. Come on, right now, why don't you ask God to change your perception, to clear up your perception, to open your perception that God wants to use you and God wants to bless you and God wants to help you. If you can perceive, you can receive. If you doubt, you do without. Come on, 
come on you're not going to perish you're going to become great for God you're going to become powerful for God God's going to use you God's boy I tell you I'd like to have an altar call right now if some of you'd like to come to the altar and just stand here and pray a while Lord clear my vision change my vision that's why the Bible said without a vision the people perish you need to ask God help my perception to realize that you're going to use me it doesn't matter how many times I fail doesn't matter how many times I've been afraid doesn't matter how many times I've done stupid stuff he that comes to God must believe that God is that means you've got to perceive that he is and that you've got to perceive he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him Lord, I need my vision cleared. I need my perception changed. Help me to stop studying the problem. Help me to stop studying the foe, the adversary, the situation. Help me to stop reliving my mistakes and my failures of yesterday. Woo! Because the peril is there and the power is there. This church, Reverend, this church will either become a Nazareth church or a Capernaum church. You're either going to shut him down or you're going to turn him loose and he's going to save everything and he's going to heal everything. The issue is not the truth. The issue is the perception of the truth. Woo! I feel the wave of the Holy Ghost here.